Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Leah Fregulia Roberts, Head of School and CEO of the Arizona School for the Arts. ASA is one of Phoenix's few public charter schools and has been recognized by U.S. News and World Report as a specialized education powerhouse and by the Wall Street Journal as one of the four top schools in Arizona. Lee has been with the school since its founding in 1995 and served as its principal before becoming head of school. She has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us and I'd like to thank you, Leah, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So a school for the arts, it's a very interesting place for you to occupy in the panoply of schools in Phoenix. Describe how the school was developed and, and the place that it occupies today. Mm. Well, ASA has a unique mission in that it's a dual-focused program. So college prep academics plays only 50% of the day. The performing arts plays the other 50%. And over time, that mission to make sure that those two programs share the stage has been the most important thing. So it's that ASA. balance between the two sides. It is the balance between the two sides, and I think that's really what sets the academic program, if you would believe it, separate and apart from any other art school and probably any other academic school as well. And today, people are so focused on STEM disciplines and on school as a preparation mm -hmm. for a college and how important it is to earn money and, and have an economically focused mm -hmm. education the arts are not economically focused, or are they? Well, there's a couple things. Absolutely, they are an economic driver, I think, in any, in any stable economy and growing and thriving economy. And if we really want people to come to our city, we need to provide the arts and culture for those people coming in. So I, I really do see the arts as an economic driver, and ASA in particular as a downtown school as part of that. I think as far as the whole STEM movement, and I support STEM wholeheartedly, but I think it should be STEAM. And I think you should put the arts in there and that it should be something that, you know, you can't have creative, innovative thinkers without some level of arts in their background. So I would say that it's just a narrower mission than it could be. Uh, we do very well in the arts and, and in the sciences and in the technology side, and it's because our students know how to think outside the box and create some interesting solutions. So what is art at, at mm. ASA? Three components, music, theater arts, and dance. So all our students, middle school students, five through eighth grade, take piano as part of their academic program. Mm -hmm. Um, they then have to take choir as part of their program, so it's very fundamentally music-based. They can choose to play an additional instrument or ballet, but they have to do one or the other. So about two and a half hours a day of arts for our middle school students. And then in the, in the high school, they can focus on one of those three areas, th theater, dance, or music. But you're also teaching in that, in that approach, you're teaching communication skills. Absolutely. You also include the literary arts, so you also have a real emphasis on writing. I mean, yep. writing and un understanding and comprehension and translating what is on the page into, mm. in, into action. You have sets that are built for your theater productions. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a it is a multi-dimensional educational experience. Very definitely. Um, in fact, one of the things that we do in the third quarter of every year is have an academic presentation which brings to bear all the sort of artistic and academic qualities that the students are supposed to be cultivating. They, we close school for a week and for 10 minutes every single student in the school makes a presentation, an academic presentation for their teachers and their parents. An academic, or, uh, could you describe what, what that entails? Yeah, they work all, um, all through the third quarter on a research project mm -hmm. in an area that's connected to the curriculum but also is an area of interest to them. And uh, they do research and they organize their ideas and they ask you know, inquiry type questions, open-ended type questions and develop a thesis, organize it into a 10 minute presentation and then they have to give kind of an extemporaneous speech, not a memorized speech. They have to be grilled for 10 minutes, question and answer style, and then they get 10 minutes of feedback from their parents and their teacher about how well they did. So very much like a jury situation, if you were a musician or a theater artist in an audition, there's a very interactive and dynamic element there. So much about education is about uh, evidence of impact, mm -hmm. and some of that evidence is hard evidence, mm -hmm. some of it's soft evidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk about how you measure the impact that you've had over the last uh, 16 years. Well, I think that the most important is where our students go to college and then what they're able to do after. So we try to keep track of our alumni. 
ASA doesn't teach to the test. Our philosophy has always been that a rigorous and interesting curriculum will produce results that mean something. And for us, ultimately, it's what happens after you leave our walls and what can you do with that. So we have students all over the nation, Stanford and Harvard and Yale and Princeton. This year we have 54 graduates um, only, but they're attending some of the top universities in the country. Beyond that, when they stay connected with us, we hear about what they're doing in the, in the world. Um, and all the way from professional artists to doing AIDS research in Africa. Um, so the impact really is about how they're impacting their community in the long run, not necessarily how their AIMS test scores are on the standardized, in the standardized world. And four years down the road, have you uh, discerned a particular uh, clustering of, of uh, people in terms of their majors are they are they focused more in the uh, disproportionately in the arts mm. or is it uh, as, as broad in terms of their own concentration once they get into college it's really broad 96 percent go on to university and only two to three percent go on to a conservatory or professional arts so most of them go to the academic side many of them minor in an arts area or they participate in their community in some way mm -hmm. in the arts, but that's not their area of focus. And we have everything from engineering. We have one um, young woman who is now on a ship on the, in, off the coast of Australia, and she's a petroleum engineer, all the way to one of the principal bases in the St. Louis Orchestra. So um, it spans the globe. One of our graduates, David Hallberg, is um, the first American ballet dancer to be accepted or, or solicited to join the Bolshoi Ballet in Moscow. He's there now. He's a principal for the Bolshoi and still maintains his principal as, um, in a, at the ABT. Oh, that's interesting. So, That's interesting. Yeah. So you've been here for 16 years now. Yeah. Talk about the first, your first day at work. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, been quite, it's been quite a pathway. Um, we only had 120 students when we opened our doors, and it was only 7th through 10th grade because we wanted to grow slowly our 11th and 12th grades when we knew that we had a solid program under our belt. Today we're 5th through 12th grade, and we're about 750 students. And so going from that small environment where we really had to prove ourselves in the educational industry, the parents who sent their kids to us really took a leap of faith. A new school opening its doors. Charter schools were a brand new concept. We were unproven. We weren't accredited. So these parents are are trusting that their children are going to get into college because we're saying college prep. Well, and I'm so, sure not not entirely trusting in in terms of not overseeing the, right. the schools no. as well. So the so the the parents are very involved from the very beginning. Absolutely. Serving on your board and and so on. Absolutely. And so did you did you open up in a in a full-blown campus? No. Oh my goodness. So no. how did you open? What, what were the facilities like? We were very fortunate to find a church in downtown Phoenix that allowed us to use what had been their classrooms mm -hmm. and um, they have kept us until this year as a matter of fact. We grew to another building across the street slowly and um, we're all in lease space. In fact I would say that we probably balanced our budget based upon some really affordable rents right. um, and as we've grown we've been able to acquire our own property and then in March we moved in completely into our brand new campus. Congratulations. So we're in the same on the same block but we are finally independent and uh, the people in the church said you know what we feel like parents that you have left the nest and now we can watch you from afar. And how did you summon the the resources required to to undertake this journey because every year mm. you have salaries to pay mm. You have teachers to recruit. Mm. You have benefits to, uh, to, to, to fund. And even mm. if your rents are inexpensive, there are still infrastructure costs. Right. right. Um, it, it's a difficult situation for us because as charter schools in Arizona, we get about $1,500 a student less than district right. schools um, because our facilities aren't funded as you pointed out. So for us it is a very challenging environment. On top of that, our arts programs alone run us about 1.2, 1.3 million dollars a year. Again, not really funded by the state. Uh, the way that we balance our budget is by some really active fundraising and, and um, making sure that our parents recognize the value of what they get and are able to support us in some way. Um, and, a, and a very lean budget. Um, we don't spend a lot on unnecessary nice-to-haves. We know two. We are doing two things. We're doing the arts and we're doing the academics. And so we don't divert a lot of our funding in any other place but into the classroom, into the faculty. What are your admissions policies? We are open admissions, so we have a lottery. 
Um, and I think most art, art schools across the nation are selective admission and audition based. ASA is a, as a charter school doesn't have any other policy but if you get your number drawn in the lottery you come through our doors and um, so we get beginning students all the way to really advanced students even in the fifth grade mm -hmm. and we take them wherever they are and we place them according to their skills not their grade which means that even the most advanced students can excel. Now recruiting teachers and retaining teachers must be particularly uh, challenging in, in, in this environment. You have to recruit for both sides. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance those two sides? Mm. Well, our academic faculty are all content area specialists, and this is where the expense of the model really right. comes into play. Our, our artists are all performing artists, so they have to be active professionally in their world. Um, and so they, they largely are all part-time. Mm -hmm. They sustain their lives based upon part-time teaching and then their own gigs in the evenings and their own private studios. So for the artist, it's kind of an ideal scenario because they get a stable income from the right. school, and then they can do some more creative things with their own work. Um, it, it's a great place for academic teachers as well um, because in the afternoon when the arts faculty come on campus that leaves the academic faculty time to, to plan, collaborate, meet about student needs, provide additional tutoring if necessary. So for them they only teach until 12.30 not the regular 3.30 or 4 o'clock during a school day. So I think that we retain our teachers because it's a really quality place to work they're given a lot of autonomy as educators um, because they are the professionals in their content area and it's, motiva it's a motivation for them. So. Well, it's interesting that you take a necessity because of the nature of the school and you mm -hmm. create it into a virtue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that virtue being that you provide a much richer, more stable platform mm -hmm. for uh, artists mm -hmm. to make their contributions mm -hmm. and to continue their art, but also to convey that sensibility to the next generation. Mm -hmm. You stabilize sort of the teaching environment that, that reduces the amount of hectic work mm -hmm. that has to constantly be invested in order to sort of keep up. Mm -hmm. And for the children, they now get the best of both worlds. They get two sets of very energized adults mm -hmm. Uh, coming in and, and helping them uh, learn. Yeah, and I think it's been a growing process over the years for the two faculty, sides of the faculty to come together um, and share their best practices and um, collaborate in unique ways as well. I know that our academic teachers have a great understanding for what the arts brings even to what happens in their classroom. Um, and vice versa, the discipline and the focus and the research and the analysis in the arts classroom, in the arts world, is just as important. So. It's great synergy. And beyond um, the, uh, financial contributions, how do parents uh, contribute to the school mm. and to sort of the daily ebb and flow mm. of the classroom? Mm. Um, most of our parents are, um, you know, coming from all across the valley, so our environment can be a little bit difficult to get a lot of parent volunteers. Those who have time and are able to come in and help us on everything from serving lunch to students during the day to um, pick up and drop off duty to working in the office. They help us with fundraisers. Uh, most importantly, they're really vocal advocates in the community. So most of our recruiting is done through word of mouth and always has been. So um, there's some very subtle and some very active ways they're involved. Uh, we tell our parents the best way that you can be involved is to support your child's education and make sure they get to class every day on time, and well fed and well rested, and that you allow them to excel in there academic and arts worlds. How do you interact with other education institutions and other mm. institutions throughout the, the Phoenix mm. Maricopa um, County area? You, you have here um, a, a symphony, a wonderful mm. symphony. You have uh, various theatrical groups. Mm. You have the, the uh, Performing Arts Center mm -hmm. uh, here. Um, how, how, how does this function, not to mention right. the other schools mm. and ASU, mm -hmm. uh, uh, being a big force yes, yes. in the state. Well, since the beginning, we've already always thrived on our arts partnerships. Um, Phoenix Theater, the School for Ballet Arizona, are big mm -hmm. major companies in the Valley, the Symphony. They provide instructors, they provide performances, support. So we, we really have cultivated some very active partnerships. Our latest is with the museum, uh, the Musical Instrument Museum, MIM, Mim um, which is just an amazing place. Yes. And our students now get to perform in exhibit um, periodically oh, really? on weekends. So 
many, many arts um, performance opportunities just through some of our partners like that. Plus, we get the advantage of having the musicians or artists that come in to talk to our students from ASU Gamage. They visit our campus and do um, talkbacks with our students or private performances. And then, of course, our students always get great ticket deals to go to <laughs> the variety of performances downtown. So um, that, that piece is great. I think that, um, you know, certainly with ASU Gamage, it's a budding relationship because they have a lot of educational programs that mm -hmm. our students get invited to. So we're sort of the school of choice now for some of those opportunities. We'd like to have um, a growing, stronger relationship on the academic side um, with ASU, and we're actively working on that, the Barrett's Honors College, et cetera, for our students. But I would say that beyond that, we know as a school we're only ever going to impact each year 800 to 850 students of our own. And so we are now working on partnerships with the schools in our areas to do um, after school and summer programming, summer arts programming for schools with under-resourced students. So students that, um, you know, 95% free and reduced lunch schools who don't necessarily put any resources in the arts will now have opportunities to attend ASA's campus and use our facilities and receive oh, some of that instruction. So just trying to expand our own reach and our own impact by um, helping schools that can't do that for their students. Are there any tensions between the various uh, schools that because schools are so under-resourced nowadays, mm -hmm. they're under so much pressure to um, to create um, great experience for kids, but but really to drive test scores to where they need to be. Um, how do other schools see um, ASA, and and how do you um, interact with them? Mm. Well, I would say, you know, for ASA, because our philosophy is so different from other. Um, you know, maybe educational institutions that that we really took a risk not to do a lot of test prep to establish a more rigorous curriculum from the ground up. And I think that we don't have the same population as a lot of schools. We're not 95% free and reduced lunch. Right. Um, our students have to get to school and that means that there's some level of parent investment to bring mm -hmm. them downtown or to put them on the light rail or, or um, develop the carpool. I think that we are not dealing with a lot of English language learners. We're not dealing with a lot of students who, you know, have some of those other economic challenges. And um, at the same time, I think those students who do attend the school that have those challenges, um, because of who we are as a school, we sweep in underneath and, and make sure that we can move them forward as well. So the areas where I think that schools most want to partner with us is in providing the arts. And I don't know that there's a lot of, um, interest or concern about the model of teaching that we sort of aspire to. There really is a, c a concern in, about test scores and those schools do have to meet certain requirements and it's a big risk and undertaking to do anything but focus their attentions on making sure that their students pass. So there's a certain attitude where you are filling sort of a, a, a niche within the community mm -hmm. um, but many of these schools see themselves as filling a different niche, not in competition with you, but, right. but more just a different place within the, within the whole ecosystem. Yeah, I, I would say that's a really, good, a, a really good way to frame that. In terms of the future for the school, you've, you've just opened up your new campus. Mm -hmm. um, what are the next uh, uh, coming challenges over the mm -hmm. next five years? Well, I think funding is for education period is just a huge challenge. And um, in Arizona, we've lost quite a bit of money over the last three to four years. So right. our, our big challenges are funding, paying for our facilities. We have bonds that have to be paid off. We're doing a capital campaign, so we need to make sure that we're successful there. We um, know that we have outstanding teachers, and teachers across the nation are not compensated fairly for what they do, and that's a big challenge if you want to retain talent. Ultimately, we have to address that issue. But I, I would say the funding formula for schools in Arizona, we're working to try and get that a second look taken at that and revised so that maybe a little bit more money can get into the educational system. Is this mostly going to be a private game or mostly a government game? I think it's going to have to be both. Um, schools are going to have to be innovative about how they approach this because um, funding from the state is always at risk to right. a certain extent. So to be sustainable, we have to be smart about making sure that our base, base needs are always covered and that we're always constantly growing our philanthropic support. Why not go the pure independent route? 
we would not be accessible to the kids that we are now accessible for. Um, we never want to be private. We want to be public, and we want students to, any student who wants to be at ASA, we want them to have a fair and equal chance at the school. So it, it's really about a philosophy that, that children should have access to that education without reference to a, a means test. It's absolutely true. And, and to take it just one step further than that even is that all students, arts are seen as sort of this nice to have or this additional enrichment and they're integral. They're integral to us as human beings and into education and, and students should have that opportunity no matter what walk of life they come from. And we'd love to see it, of course, spread across the nation, but um, we will do whatever we can to make sure that our world is impacted in that way. Well, this is, this is an amazing model. It's so important. We see arts being neglected mm -hmm. across the nation mm -hmm. as budgets are becoming tighter and tighter, but mm -hmm. that does have a real impact mm -hmm. on children and communities mm -hmm. and on the ability of communities to attract creatives. When you walk into a mm -hmm. new city, where do you go? You go to their museums, you go to the performing mm -hmm. arts, you, you listen to the music, the, the heartthrob of those cities mm -hmm. is not just the, the, uh, the pounding of traffic mm -hmm. as it goes uh, over the streets, but it's also uh, the music that you hear as you, as you walk by places. Mm -hmm. and, and so you're making a contribution to uh, Phoenix that is incredibly valuable. And I'd like to thank you so much for your insights. Thank you so much.